So good morning, church. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. Hey, so, so if I'm starting back here, that means we have baptisms today. Amen. Uh, when we do baptism, it is a, a public display of an inward, inward transformation that's taking place. It is a public acknowledgement that we have made Jesus Lord of our lives. And so today we have two candidates that are going to be baptized, and I'm so excited to get this opportunity to be able to be a part of their, a small part of their spiritual journey uh, as they continue to grow in grace and walk with the Lord. Amen. Can we start by giving them a round of applause for getting baptized? Amen. It's a huge thing. It is a, a big deal and, and something that is uh, amazing that, that was left for us in the church, that Jesus left for us to be able to participate in. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to bring my first candidate down, Miss Deborah Inlow. Everybody say, hey, Miss Deborah. Deborah. <laughs> so here, I'm going to have you sit right here for me. So Deborah came to us uh, recently and actually is a new member of our church. And Deborah said that, you know, it is time for me to get baptized. It is time for me to make this decision to make my public profession of my faith to everyone. And so we're excited for that. And so, Deborah, what I get the chance to ask you is, what is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Amen. She said, Jesus is Lord. So with that, I want you to turn. You can put your feet down below in the little, the little slide right there. Down there. There you go. All right. So right now, my sister, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, which is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We go down with him, and we rise to new life in Christ. Amen. I'm going to turn this way, and we'll go out this way. Let me help you up. Good. All right. Good to go. My brother. So next is my brother, Derek. Come on, Derek. Everybody say, hey, Derek. I was talking with Derek several weeks ago, and Derek said, you know, Pastor, I've never been baptized. He said, I believe in the Lord with, my, with all of my heart. He said, but you know, the Holy Spirit's been telling me it's time. And I said, well, amen, brother, let's, let's do it. It's nothing like uh, hearing from the Holy Spirit for ourselves. And as we've gone through even the book of Acts, as we've gone through this study, we've seen them again and again, even in today's message, hearing from the Holy Spirit. And so we celebrate the fact that not only did you listen to the Holy Spirit, but you took the, co the corresponding action from what you heard. And so we're proud of you, brother, for making this decision and making your profession of faith. So with that being said, uh, what, do you, what is your profession of faith, brother? Jesus is my Lord. He said that Jesus is my Lord. Amen. So with that, brother, I'm going to turn you this way. It is my privilege to be able to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, which is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We go down with him, and we rise to new life in Christ. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. He chose Oh, that with yonder sacred throng 
about this. And crown him Lord of all. Amen, amen, amen. Let's turn and greet one another this morning as we continue our fellowship and worship at Love Bridge. Let's sing together. What heart could hold the weight of your love and know the heights of your great word? What eyes could look on your glorious face shining like the sun? Let's sing that verse again. What heart could hold the weight of your love and know the heights of your great word? What eyes could look on your glorious face shining like the sun? You are
your glorious face shining like the sun who is like you god you are holy 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 god most high and god most worthy you are holy 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 jesus you are jesus you are jesus you are jesus you are sing this chorus with me your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory all praise will rise to christ our king your name your name So we've been in the series of Acts, and we have one more week after today, and we finish Acts. Uh, I don't know if that's supposed to be amen, or if that's like we're glad, or I don't know, but, but that's, it is what it is. So we have one more week uh, of the book of Acts. Uh, today we're going to cover chapter 27, tomorrow, I mean tomorrow, next Sunday we'll cover chapter 28. Uh, and so where we found Paul last week was, he was before King Agrippa, and he was pleading his case or defending his innocence that he didn't do anything wrong. 
sharing about his testimony and his, and on the road to Damascus. And, and what we uh, looked at last week was he convinced them, but he appealed his case to Caesar. And so King Agrippa said, although I believe him, because he's appealed his case to Caesar, I'm going to send him to Rome. And so today what we're going to see is Paul's kind of journey from where he was to Rome. And newsflash, they had a shipwrecked. <laughs> Things didn't necessarily go as planned on their way to Rome in today's passage. Um, and so I'm going to talk from the title today, uh, uh, Lessons from a Loss. And so and let me, let me uh, talk about the proverbial elephant in the room, uh, no pun intended. So I, obviously I'm a big University of Georgia fan. And I know you say, Pastor, lessons from a loss. Oh, this is a good way for you to say something about, you know, if you get down, you keep fighting to the end like Georgia came and fought back, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or something about it's not how you start, it's how you finish, right? No, I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, I'll let the Alabama fans have it for now. <laughs> for now. But as we go through the passage today, what I want you to pay close attention to are what lessons can we take from this story and apply it to our lives. What can we see from this journey, and that's where I'm gonna highlight, from this journey that they take on their way to Rome that we can apply to our lives. And uh, we're gonna read through the passage uh, all the way down through chapter 27, and then we're gonna look at some nuggets and some points, and then, you know, we're gonna go and do whatever we're doing after this. So, Acts chapter 27, uh, if you will, Acts chapter 27, I'm gonna start at verse number one. I'm going to be reading it from the New Living Translation. Please feel free to follow along with whatever translation that you have. We'll get to the same place. But Acts chapter 27, starting at verse 1, this is what it says. It says, when the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. Our Arista Char ah, I almost had it. Our Aristar Charters. Ah, dang it. I'm gonna try it again. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adramatitum on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. The next day we docked at Sidon. Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. We sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland, keeping to the open sea. We passed along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing in Myra in the province of Lycia. There, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We had several days of slow sailing, and after great difficulty, we finally neared Sinaitis. But the wind was against us. So we sailed across to Crete and along the sheltered coast of the island, past the Cape of Salmon. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty and finally arrived at Fair Havens, near the, near the town of Lycia. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall, and Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and to the owner than Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor or poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, further up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete, but the weather changed abruptly, and a wind typhoon strength called a nor'easter burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship in the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of the small island named Cauda, 
where with great difficulty we hoisted, we hoisted aboard the lifeboat uh, being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the shrimp to, around the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of Sardis off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to, the, to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until, at last, all hope was gone. Verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me, and he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Verse 27. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm. So it's been storming for 14 days. As we were being driven across the sea of Adria, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was about 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the, from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officers and soldiers, you will die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboats and let it drift away. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You've been so worried that you hadn't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. All 276 of us who are on board. So again, this is a huge ship, 276 people. I don't know if it was a Royal Caribbean, if they did the cha-cha slide. I don't, I don't know, but it, but it was 276 people. This is a large boat. After eating, the crew, in li the, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to the shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors, left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed toward the shore. But they hit a shawl, a shoal, and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the boat of the ship sunk fast, stuck fast, while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape, but the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so they didn't, so they didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make it to land. The others held on the planks and the breeze from the broken ship. So everyone escaped safely to the shore. So they're headed to Rome, and they got shipwrecked along the way. Let's look at how this unfolded. And I want to start by looking at the warning that they were given. I'm going to go back to verses just 10 through 12 for the sake of emphasis because Paul gives them a warning first. So look here in verses, uh, verse number 10. I'm just going to read 10 and 12 one more time to talk about this warning that he gives them. What does he say? He says, men, he said, I believe there's trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and to the owner than Paul. And says, Fair Havens was an exposed harbor. Again, what was the issue? They didn't want to stay there all winter. A poor place to spend the winter. Most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, further up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. Uh, how many times <laughs> have we had somebody issue a warning to us, 
but we ignored the warning and had to deal with the negative consequences of that decision. Oh, and everybody says amen. Okay, okay. <laughs> when I look at this, I can see God's grace all in the warning. You say, why? Because they should have known the conditions were bad prior to even getting that warning. We see that ahead of time. But even if they saw the conditions were bad or should have noticed the conditions were bad, again, these were experienced fishermen or experienced sailors, I should say, uh, God still gave them a warning even in the midst of obvious conditions that they shouldn't go ahead. You say, what was the warning? Let's go back to verse number four one more time, real quick. Verse, verse four, because we read it, but you probably didn't even pay attention to it. In verse four, look at what it says in verse four. So this is when they first set out. It said, putting out to sea there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between uh, the island and the mainland. Uh, if you have uh, the King James, it says something about the wind being against us. I think is what it says in the King James there. But we'll keep going. It says, keeping to the open sea, we passed along the island of Cilicia, Pamphylia, uh, landing in Myra in the province of Lycia. There the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We had several days of slow sailing. So again, they're having slow sailing, right? And after great difficulty, we finally neared Sinaitis. But the wind was against us. He says the wind was against us. I wonder at times, do we notice when the conditions are not going against, are not going in our favor, but actually going against us? Now, that in and of itself isn't always a, a, a means for you to stop, right? Because so, so, again, if we're doing things for the Lord, we should expect trouble, right? We should expect the normal oppositions of life. But if you couple, you see something going on also with God giving you a warning, I'm just saying, might not be the time to get on Lake Lanier, right? It might not be the time to keep going, right? I'm sorry, Lake Lanier, what, you, you know. <laughs> so there were obvious signs that things uh, uh, were maybe not going to go well and that they should adjust their plans and change course. It was obvious. They should adjust their plans and change course. And here is the question that I want to ask you. You have my question up there, Audrey? Let's put it on the screen. What do you do when it becomes obvious that you need to adjust your plans and change course? You know what I realized? It's not enough for us to just be aware we're at a turning point. <laughs> it's not enough for us to just be aware that I need to change my plans. It's not, just, it's not enough for me to be aware. It's like, man, God, I feel like God keeps speaking to me about this thing. Okay. It's not enough to be aware if we don't take action. All the signs were there. And Paul told them, listen, the an angel of the Lord told me last night. We see them keep going. But do we keep going? Do you pay attention to the signs and listen to the warnings that come? Ah, I'm going to hit you with a great scripture here. Uh, turn with me. Uh, we'll turn back. We're going to turn right back to Acts. But turn with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. Proverbs 22, verse 3. Sometimes it's just so good. You just say, oh, man. Proverbs 22, 3. See, y'all already reading on the screen. Y'all cheating. Y'all cheating. They're turning. <laughs> Proverbs 22, verse 3. Look at what this says. It says, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Now, if you have the King James, it says a fool. Now, I'm not calling anybody a fool. That's what the King James says, all right? But think about this. One person foresees danger, and what do they do? Take precautions. Well, someone else goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we a prudent person or are we a simpleton? You know, often before our, our ships wreck, <laughs> We get time after time and chance after chance. We get warning after warning, opportunity after opportunity to change course, to do something different. 
Do we foresee the danger and take precautions? What does it say? Go on blindly and suffer the consequences. Here's the larger question, though. Are we willing to follow God's interruptions to our plans when it is inconvenient? You say inconvenient? Yeah, what they said was, although they were safe in harbor with all of their stuff, they said, oh, we don't want to stay at this harbor because it's not as cool to stay here. We want to go to a different harbor in Phoenix where we think it's going to be better. You know what I've learned? Uh, uh, this thing my, uh, my granddad used to say, there's no lesson like a bought lesson. Because <laughs> you pay the price for it. You get it? It's, it's a bought lesson. And had they listened at this point, they would have still had their stuff because they were going to be stuck somewhere for the winter. It ended up taking them three months to get to where they needed to go because they had to stay. And I wonder how many times do we find ourselves in a similar situation where we're getting a warning and we find ourselves on some dry land that we can stay put on, but we keep pushing it and lose everything or lose more than we should have. The centurion, the pilot of the ship, and the owner of the ship, don't listen to Paul's advice. And as I look at them, I got to be honest, I see myself. I think about all those times where uh, uh, I didn't follow the warning that was there. One of the questions I thought about um, that I think we ought to reflect on our own lives is this. What reasons uh, do we often give? Uh, next one, Audrey. What reasons do we often give for not listening to sound advice that is given to us? You know what I love about this question? So if this was Wednesday night, we would chop it up and, 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 and have a whole discussion about this. But I ask this question now because I think this is a question you need to think about. Because if you find yourself in a situation where God's giving you a warning, you got to say, well, what is it that's causing me to not listen? To not take heed? to not take the, respond, the corresponding action that I know I need to take when I sense uh, God telling me to do something here. When I think about this, I wonder, do we carry this into our relationship with God? So for them, they were on a boat and they were going somewhere, but are there times where God is telling us, hey, don't be a don't, don't, don't keep messing around with those people. But God's like, nope, I, I, don't take that position. This is not the one for you. But God's like, nope, don't, don't do this. Don't go there. But do we ignore that? And as the verse in Proverbs say, suffer the consequences. I think the answer is yes, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you ever experienced storms or wreckage because you didn't listen? So picture this scene. They make a plan to head to Rome. From jump, they notice that the conditions are difficult, so much so that they can't even control the ship well as they're going to those early ports. This should have been assigned to them, but they pressed on. They got a word from the Lord, but they still pressed on in opposition to this warning from God. And they found themselves in a storm that lasted for 14 days. Like we slept through the storm the other night. It just went through, right? But can you imagine for 14 days of being in darkness and not seeing light? In moments when I was like the captain and the crew, and I sensed that I needed to change my plans, I sensed God saying maybe to wait or to do something else, but I went ahead anyway, and it was disastrous. And at some point, we must ask ourselves again, why do we do this? Why do we make the choices that we make, especially when it's clear that God is telling us to do something different? And so I'll tell you this, two things. One is this. We must watch out. We must, we must watch out. Uh, we must watch out for our plans or allegiance that we allow to have a higher priority in our lives than what God says. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, sometimes 
we say, well, but I told everybody else I was going to do this. And we let that be more important than what we sense God is telling us now. Don't do that. Right? Here's another way to say what I'm saying. Go to the next one, Audrey. Sometimes, and this is me, so I can't say this for y'all. I'll say this for me. Sometimes pride, selfishness, or even trying to keep our word can cause us to err instead of admitting that we need to just change our plans. There is nothing wrong with saying, you know what? I know I said I was going to do this, but I can't do this now. What I think about is I remember, um, <laughs> I think about this example where uh, this was years ago, and the kids were little, little at the time. Aubrey was, was much younger. But we had, uh, it was one of those days where we had a bunch, of, like three different events that were all scheduled on the same day. And the last event was two of them for the kids, like school stuff. And the last event was a friend was having this thing, and we really wanted to support the thing. But what happened was we got delayed at the first thing, got delayed at the second thing, and the friend's thing was like on the other side of town. And so it started like at 7, and we get there like at 9.30 when it's about the end. And it was almost like, why, why even come, right? But we tried to come, and, and it was like, even before we left, it was like we were exhausted. And I remember thinking, we just need to go home. And so we went, and it was just bad, and I felt bad because we popped in and, and popped out or whatever it was. And at times, what I, what I, when I reflect on situations like that where we've gone ahead and we've done it because we said this and we had maybe noble reasons to do that, it is okay to say, you know what, plans have changed. It's okay to say, man, I sense God telling me to do something different. It's okay to say, I know we, we've been, we said we were going to do this, but I have to have my allegiance to him first before you. And it's not that I'm trying to go back on my word, but I don't have peace about it anymore, and that's okay. And it's tough, right? Because we want to be honest with people. We want to do the right things. We want to, we want to be accountable to our word. But again, our word and our bond to him should be the highest thing in our life. Above family, above friends, above all these other things. And it's okay to say, yeah, I know we said this, but I can't. I love their example because when we look at the story, look at all the destruction. They threw everything overboard, crashed the ship, and walked away with nothing but their lives. And maybe you didn't get in a shipwreck. Maybe you didn't have to cast everything on board. But often when we talk about these things, you think about situations where it's like, man, if I would have just listened to God, I wouldn't even have found myself in the situation. And then often when you go ahead and do it anyway, you regret it the whole way. You get there and like, man, I knew I shouldn't have came and did da-da-da-da-da, whatever it is. I love this line. Again, sometimes pride, selfishness, or even trying to keep our word can cause us to err instead of admitting that we need to change our plans. I want to go back to verse number 20, 20 through 26. This part is when the storm kept raging. I want to look at this one more time. It says, the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars, until at last all hope was gone. Man, sometimes you find yourself in a storm or a dark season that goes on so extended and so long that, that, that hope starts to fade. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. And in the midst of this, man, it's so good when God can send somebody to remind you to please take courage. He says, none of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely, surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God's in his goodness has granted safety to everyone who's sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe, God, it will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Same question for you. Have you ever been in a storm <laughs> that raged for much longer than you expected and you started to feel all hope was lost? You know what I love about this passage? I don't love it, but I do. See, sometimes it's different when we look at stories and uh, or we look at parts of the Bible and it's something that happened to them. You know, like, like, like with Paul, they're trying, to, they're trying to stone him or they're trying to attack him, and so it's people doing it to them. 
But in this story, what we see here, it was their fault. It wasn't somebody outside. It was, it was, it was me. It was, it was, I did it. I, I didn't listen. And even in the mess of our doing, God can remind us of his grace and restore hope to us. If you find yourself in a dark season, you can have courage that God is with you and that God can send people to remind you to focus on him even as you find yourself in a dark season. And I say that because we're all smiley and, and everything right now, but you have no idea if the person next to you finds himself in a dark season. If right now are, 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 are at, the, at the edge, <laughs> if right now are just like trying to maintain that hope. And, and I'll say this, um, we have to be careful because often we think the attack that we have from the enemy is towards our faith. And I argue, I, I disagree with that. I think often it's not about our faith. Many of us have really strong faith, but it's really our hope that I think gets attacked. And you say, why? Because if you think about what Hebrews 11 says, faith is, a, is the substance of things hoped for, right? So what faith does is bring the thing we're hoping for to pass. And so why would he attack our hope? Because if you have strong faith, but you're hoping for nothing, your faith's not bringing anything to pass. So we have to be mindful of the fact that our hope is being attacked, that it's trying to be undercut, that we maintain and, 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 and stay consistently the same in who we are as we're trusting God as we find ourselves in storms. And, you know, one thing that I think about that's good news so, so let, me, let me hear y'all say, say good news. You know what's good news? Sometimes you're reading the King James and it says like, and it came to pass. You know, like, like good old, you know, King James English. It says, and it came to pass. And when we read that, we don't even realize uh, what we're saying. Some things didn't come to stay. They came to do what? Pass. Storms have an expiration date. Trouble has an expiration date. Storms will pass. Does that mean it's easy and we're all smiling and happy while we're going through it? No. But, but man, I often think to myself, can I hang on and make it through to the other side? Can I trust him even in the midst of what I'm dealing with right now, even if no one seems to be paying attention or noticing what's going on with me? That part. Push through the storm. Trust him even in those dark seasons. One last section. Verse 27. In verse 27, it says this, about midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the sea of, the, of Adria, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found that it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driving against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors uh, from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were, going to, they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officers and soldiers, you will die unless, you, unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboats and let it drift away. In the midst of trouble, do you see what the crew did? They did whatever they knew to do to get out of the situation. And I believe there's a lesson here for us. We trust God to do his part, but still should do what we know to do while we're trusting God to do his part. A amen? I I look, I, I wrote it more eloquently than this. Uh, uh, here it is on your screen. Do all that you can. Go back, go back, go back. There it is. Do all that you can to fix the problem, then trust God to do his part. Somebody needs to hear that because some people say, Pastor, I'm in the storm, so I'm just going to sit here and wait on the Lord. You can wait on the Lord, but there's something you should be doing. A a amen. The good news is that at the end of the story, they make it to shore. They've experienced loss, but made it there with their lives. And here it is. When we find ourselves going through an encounter or an experience, I think something that we don't necessarily readily do, but we should do, is reflect on what happened. We should reflect, and here's the question. Uh, I think it's, it's always important for us to reflect and ask, what did we learn from what we just experienced? Look, some of them are like, I'm not getting on a boat again, right? <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the lesson, though. The lesson was heeding to the warning, right? 
It was hearing from God and taking the corresponding action when you sense God telling you to do it. Um, when we look at this, in spite of the challenges that we see, Paul speaks to them in that dark season and says, don't be afraid and keep up their courage. Two final questions for you today as you look at your journey and where you find yourselves. Uh, one is this, what are the things that cause you to keep up your courage in difficult situations? Is it prayer? Is it spending time with God? Is it sharing it with those who can walk with you in these seasons? It's important to remember those things, right? To say, okay, man, if I find myself in the storm, how am I going to maintain my courage? Because to me, again, I, I, I'm, I'm like a, a visual learner. I, I try to imagine what it was like. We've been in the storm for 14 days, and this dude says, hey, guys, keep courage. I'm like, what? But he says keep courage because, again, we're going through it. I mentioned that we should be learning as we go, even in the midst of the storms. And so the last question kind of is a take on the question we asked previously, but this is a personal one for you. What are you learning about the current season you find yourself in? When you look at where you are now, when you look at what's going on, what are you learning? I think about Giselle over there. She's like, if a baby's due in December, there's stuff she's learning during this season. Probably I can't sleep right now, right? I know, that's how it was for us. But, the, but as we find ourselves in different seasons, there's things we're learning. Don't miss the lesson that you should be learning because I believe those lessons help us as we keep going. And don't just go through the encounter and just keep going and never take the wisdom and adhere to it. Amen? So as you go forward, be courageous, heed to those warnings, trust God fully, and recognize and apply the lessons that you're learning on the journey that you find yourselves in. Amen? So if you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, uh, man, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get saved. We saw my two friends get baptized earlier, right? And what they've done is made a public profession of the faith that they professed in Jesus Christ. So here's what we believe here. One, we believe that Jesus really did live, that he walked this earth, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried for three days, he rose again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. That by placing our faith in that death, that burial, and resurrection is what gives us the opportunity that when we die to go to heaven. You say, well, pastor, I hadn't done all the right things. No, no, no. He's paid the price for it, and we have to freely receive this gift. As Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you are saved. You can be sure of it. You can trust in it. But if you hadn't made that decision, one day you're going to die, and you need to make that decision before you die. And so when I ask that question, it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's about you securing your future after this life is over. And you have to know that you know for yourself that you've made that decision. And so, in a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And I'll just simply ask you, if you're not sure that you will go to heaven when you die, this is an opportunity for you to get saved. This is your moment. Don't leave this place being unsure. Don't leave this place or leave it up to chance, as they say. There is no chance. You're either certain or you're not. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. So when we stand and sing, if you need to get saved, please come down and talk to one of our prayer counselors and get saved. That's the first thing. The second thing is what we call rededication. Rededication is for those who say, well, pastor, I made that decision to place my faith in Jesus, but if I'm honest, I know I'm not living the life that I should be living. Maybe there's been loss, there's been hurt, there's been bad decisions, there's been drugs, there's been sex, there's been a whole, type, a whole bunch of stuff. And you say, man, I feel like I'm off course. I feel like I'm just out here. Maybe I feel like I'm stuck. And often what happens is, is when we find ourselves in that position, we're walking around with guilt and condemnation. And we might think that, man, I can't talk to God because maybe God's mad at me. Or we'll say stuff like, oh, I have to get myself together before I come back to God. And nothing can be further from the truth. 
God loves us with a never failing, undying love. And what he tells us to repent. He says, what do you do? You turn away from that thing and turn back to him, right where you are. I often use an analogy of a GPS when you're driving in a car, because what a GPS does is, as you're driving in a car, uh, the GPS says, hey, go for it for two miles. But because I'm driving a car, I can take a different turn. I can go in a different direction. But I found that the GPS never yells at me. Instead, it charts a course based on my current location to get me to where I need to go. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit does with us. It's charting a course to get us to where we need to go. And if you say, man, that is me. I, I, I want to rededicate and recommit myself to the things of God. We love to walk you through that process. So if that's you and you say, man, I want to rededicate uh, when our prayer counselors come down, please come talk to one of them. Uh, third is prayer. If you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too small, there's nothing too large. We count it a privilege and a joy to be able to pray with you, pray for you, and add our prayers of faith and agreement with one another. Last and certainly not least, if God's called you to be a part of this church, we would love to have you. And here's something you should know. So, so one, one of our biggest things is we love to teach, the, we strive to teach the Word of God in a simple and uncomplicated way so you can understand it and go live it, right? Second, uh, we get busy in our community because that's what we feel the Bible's teaching us and tells us we should do. And third, we are a church made up of people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different ages. And God has brought us here together to bring our gifts and talents to be used here at the church, but also beyond these four walls in this community. And if you say, man, i love to be a part of that, well, we would love to have you. So I've given you four things. One, if you need to get saved, if you need to rededicate, if you need prayer, or if God's called you to be a part of this church, uh, I want to ask you at this time, if you're able to, can you stand for a moment right where you're sitting? And I'm going to ask my prayer counselors to come and get in position. And so in this moment, um, if you need to respond to one of those four things, please, ma'am, please, sir, come on down.